Welcome to the Fit for Success podcast. Brian Semling is an experienced entrepreneur with over 25 years in business. He is the founder and CEO of Blitz Innovation. He has built several brands such as Brian's Toys, a collectible toy business, to several Amazon FBA brands like Strictly Bricks and Clever Creations. His latest adventure is Rovox, a modern athleisure footwear brand which can be found at rovoxfootwear.com. On the podcast, Brian will talk with other entrepreneurs and social media influencers about their entrepreneurial journey, from what it takes to start and run a business to how they may continue to grow their brands and where they see themselves in their businesses in the future. And now, here's your host, Brian Semling. All right. Welcome to Fit for Success. Uh, I'm Brian Semling. Today, our guest is Stephen Pope, uh, founder of My Amazon Guy. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks for having me on, Brian. You bet. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'd like to get started. Uh, tell me about yourself, your business, and how you got started. So I run a company called My Amazon Guy, and we're a full-service Amazon agency built to grow sales on Amazon.com. So we help brands uh, maneuver um, all things considered traffic and conversion strategies. So on the traffic side, you got PPC and SEO, and on conversion, anything related to design or catalog merchandising. Um, I actually started my career out as a television reporter, and I did that for a couple of years uh, in Idaho and Wisconsin. And then there was a really major storm. It was like the biggest in a decade that hit uh, the Madison, Wisconsin area, Channel 27, um, WKOW, and it was where I was at at the time. And, you know, it was 10 o'clock at night. It was just after the Scott Walker protests, and it was just a miserable time to be a television reporter. I did a live weather hit at 10 o'clock at night, and a blizzard came in. And everybody's at home in their pajamas. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there doing a live weather hit. And my I missed the cue because I could, literally couldn't see the cameraman. There was so much <laughs> snow. And so I, I missed the cue. I, I'm sitting there looking like an idiot on television for 30 seconds. My hair froze over. It was just totally miserable. So I was like, I got I to gotta change things up. So I went back to school and picked up an MBA and broke into e-commerce. And I've been doing that ever since. So I worked for over a course of a decade. I worked for four failed startups, everything from women's plus size clothing, the kitchen equipment, gold and silver coins, uh, which by the way, I think is the easiest product in the world to sell is gold and silver. Uh, and after I did that, all that, you know, one failed startup later in the lighting equipment industry, I decided, you know, I'm tired of making all these companies millions of dollars. They make some other major mistake. Well, they'll, they'll buy like a warehouse with 5 million square feet and they can't fill it. Um, or they'll print too many catalogs or whatever else it would be. Something outside of my control is the digital marketer. Sure. And I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on my own. So I became an entrepreneur and I started my Amazon guy. And uh, within 48 hours, I had solidified a domain name, signed my first client contract for three grand a month. And that client is still with me today, um, four years later. So it's been a really great run. Um, now today we have 160 full service clients and accounts we run and over 110 employees in over 10 countries in the world. Very cool and uh, exciting story. Thanks for sharing that uh, vivid uh, description of Madison, Wisconsin uh, snowstorm leading to, uh, to your business. That's pretty cool. And uh, I'm located in Fountain City, Wisconsin, just a couple hours. Uh, That's why I ahead. dropped a few more Wisconsin hints after I, I, I knew you were in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. So what are, uh, what are the challenges you face as an entrepreneur? It, the way you described it, it sounded uh, fantastic and uh, not so bad. There must have been some challenges along the way uh, for sure, right? Every business ever has to do three things, right? And this isn't going to be news to anybody, but it's people, product, and process. And I'd say I'm more of a product and systems guy, right? Like, so for those that have done culture index, I'm an architect, I'm deductive. I think about the data points. The people part has always been the hardest part for me because I don't like to have drawn out fluffy conversations, at, you know, in HR building, right? Like that's not my thing. But what I did figure out though, is if I treated the science behind people, right. And it's a very, you know, introverted thing for me to say it this way, but that's, that's how I did it. I had to, I had to come up with a system for how to plug and play people into an agency. And what I learned, you know, and I'm a big fan of Gary V. I like his messaging. I don't like his delivery method, but I like his messaging. And, uh, you know, he said when he first started his agency, everybody told him, People are going to stay between 12 and 18 months at an agency. That's just a fact of matter. And Gary Vee's like, you know what? I, maybe at your agency, but at my agency, they're going to stay five 
six, seven, 10 years. And that was a pretty big aha moment for me early on when I was building agency. I was like, what would it take to convince people to stay that long? And I'll be honest, I don't feel like I'm any closer to answering that question today. It's really hard uh, because especially with the big resignation we experienced this summer and just so many people um, hit hip scopping everywhere you want to find, um, you know, where they want to feel the best home or for a job. I've really had to spend most of my time as a CEO putting on my culture hat. And instead of, I don't feel like I run an agency anymore. <laughs> I feel like I run an HR company. And, and it's because I'm literally administrating, you know, feed my sheep, you know, style to, to the people in my organization. And it's, you know, and I, and I build out a bunch of structure to make that happen. I have a chart and a graph that shows like the prioritization of the company and employees are at the top above our clients, in fact. Yeah. And I'm very public with this graphic, right? Like I tell my clients, I put my employees before you guys. If you guys are assholes, we're going to fire you, right? To my clients, I say that. And, and it, it's just a really great dichotomy. And what's happened, I was in a meeting yesterday with 50 people in my, my North American division for our account management, okay? And we introduced five new hires. So we hired five new people that started yesterday. Four of them were direct referrals from other members of the company coming in. To, coming in. And the fifth one had literally paid us more than $1,000 in coaching fees where he'd hired us to help him on his own Amazon account. Huh? So the way that we're acquiring talent, I don't think many people can even state that they've had somebody pay them money and then got hired, right? It's a weird thing. Yeah. But that's, the, that's the culture and state of affairs that we're in um, as an agency is selling on Amazon and helping brands. So I know I kind of meandered there and I'll let you retool where you want to go with that. But it's, you know, those are some interesting things that we've been up to. Yeah, no, that's interesting. It sounds like um, I think you figured out that the best way to serve your customers, which every business needs to do, is to prioritize your employees. And if you do that, um, they're taking care of your customers and that, that ultimately is, uh, is winning right now, basically. That's, uh, that's the best path. So that's neat. Um, what are some mistakes that you've made as an entrepreneur along the way? Because I am very self-confident, I didn't hire a leadership team. And so I became very single threaded. And what that means is that I had to play the, the balancing act of juggling all of the leadership duties, right? So my C-suite right now is still too light for where we are as a company, in my opinion. I have, I have a chief technology officer and I have a senior uh, director of operations and four account directors. That makes up my leadership team right now. And realistically, I probably should be at three, maybe four C-suite executives at the stage that we're at as a company. So for those that have read Traction out there um, or Rocket Fuel, I am wearing both the integrator and the visionary hat even today. Um, very comfortable doing it. I think, you know, in the book, it specifies there's a small percentage of people that can pull off both comfortably. I, I happen to be that small percentage. Again, the challenge with that, though, is that the mistake I've, I've made that I've been trying to correct over the last year, especially, is I haven't hired enough leaders to help buoy up the company and run it without me. And that means I don't have as much time to put my CMO hat on, which is the hat I like wearing, to go out and do more podcasts, to go out there and evangelize the company and go to uh, conferences and, and do all those things that a, a CMO could do to attract new, new to file acquisitions for the company. So that's where I'm going to head. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buoy up my leadership team. We're going to promote more people from within. Um, I also made the mistake of trying to hire outside leadership that didn't gel with uh, some of the core values that I was trying to build. So we have a very structured core value system. And this is the weirdest one. It's impatience, right? We're trying to hire impatient individuals who go get stuff done. Very abnormal. You wouldn't hear that from most companies. Yeah, right? I like it though, yeah. Most people would be like, impatience, that's a, that's a bad quality. Uh, no, it's, it's an amazing quality. And it makes sense for our company because in the agency world, impatient people can keep up with chaos, massive amounts of chaos, which, which by the way, we don't build, we don't make the chaos. We're trying to create order out of chaos and systems 
are nonstop being put into place with SOPs and, you know, dictation or whatever, but because Amazon's an evolving beast and is different on a Monday versus a Friday, they roll something out, they make changes. It's hard to keep up with it. It's also my net benefit of why the agency adds value to the companies because the companies can't keep up with it who hire us. But nonetheless, uh, so I hired some less than tech savvy patient individuals um, in the leadership court because I thought I needed to diversify the yeah. skill set. And what I found over time is that the complete opposite is true. Instead of hiring for diversity, you only should be hiring for competency who all marry to the core values of the company. And I think that's really structurally important, something I've, I've had to kind of fix over the last year. Interesting. Yeah, I've uh, participated and read uh, the EOS books that you've uh, talked about. And um, it's been a pretty popular kind of management system um, in general and certainly in the kind of the Minnesota, Wisconsin area for sure. So um, interesting. And it is interesting to hear that you're one of those rare integrators and visionaries because that is kind of uh, I'm more on the visionary side of things. And that's uh, like there, most people don't have the the unique talents to pull both off at the same time, basically. So it's not easy, that's for sure, but it's rewarding for me. I like it. So right. you got to go with how you, uh, with what your natural um, strengths are basically. And so that's, uh, so that's neat. Um, what do you think in general it takes to be successful as an entrepreneur? I think you've covered some of this in just kind of your own background so far, but um, if you're talking so, to, to other people, what, uh, what does it take to be successful as an entrepreneur? My strategy is iteration. So like my number one, you know, just to drop another book, unique ability is, is iteration. So a lot of people are like, let me measure this twice, maybe three times, and then I'll place my cut. My strategy is the action dictates the strategy. <laughs> so we go out and we just make lots of micro adjustments constantly. Now, again, net benefit chaos, right? This means <laughs> it means a lot of changes continuously throughout the process building, but that's that's really been the success. So I think um, a lot of entrepreneurs get weighed down on having to perfect things before they get going. And that's, of course, not necessary. You don't need to have an A plus in the core, all three core areas of running a business. You need an A in one of them, and you need at least a C in the other two, right? On people, product, and process. You could also look at this from a department standpoint. You could be like finance, marketing, and operations. Like you could break it down that three, three way as well. Same concept. You don't need to have an A in all three of those to have a successful company. You only need an A in one of them. And then the other two, you need passing C's, get degrees. So I think that entrepreneurs need to figure out which one they have the A in already and just triple down on it and make sure that you have vertical integration on that single area that nobody can touch you on. Rovox, where fashion meets fitness. And it sounds like you're saying once you recognize that you have that, get going. You don't need to uh, sit back and plan forever, basically, because perfect can be the enemy of... Uh you know, uh, moving on is perfect for me. <clears throat> now for the detail oriented individuals out there who, um, are all about the details and things need to be as expected that will drive them crazy. That won't work for them. But for those that have high drive, the visionary profiles, if you will, yeah, uh, let the action dictate the strategy, build a plan as you're going along. Uh, what companies or entrepreneurs inspire you? Gary V, number one, um, I am trying to build my agency with his framework in mind. So we give, I actually discovered him halfway through my journey. So I was already doing pretty much everything Gary V was espousing without even knowing he existed. But once I learned he existed, I was able to articulate much clearer uh, the vision that I was trying to do. So we give away all of our trade secrets. Um, I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash my Amazon guy with over 800 videos where I give away literally my entire playbook on how to run Amazon. Now, the benefit to doing that is I have a huge employee talent pool coming to our company because they've already used us to help them in their current roles. We It's our sales pipeline. So um, I was trying to hire a chief of staff back in June and I didn't pull the trigger. It wasn't quite, I didn't quite feel like I had a good fit. Again, couldn't quite fill out my C-suite, right? Not quite there on that. 
but I had everybody in the interview process do a technique that I, I don't, I've never heard of anybody else ever using. And I had them draw my org chart without any facts beyond like three basic things. Basically told them what our, what our gross revenue was, how many employees, and, and that was basically it. And I'm like, okay, we're an agency, you know that, you've done some research. I want you to literally draw the org chart with me live on a Zoom interview. And very interesting to see that almost all candidates, nine out of 10, would draw a sales team with like 10 or 15 bodies. My sales team is my father, who's a retired weatherman out of Utah, Dan Pope, huh? a sales assistant VA, and my YouTube channel. That's it. So what I found out that the value of the content production that we've done is worth the equivalent of a 10 man sales team. And it's really interesting. I look at the metrics all the time on YouTube and you know, we're, we're in the thousands of hours of consumed content on a weekly basis. It's really great. Cool. That's uh, that's fantastic. And I think that your, uh, your goal from the beginning of keeping clients for five or 10 years, even though you were told that wasn't Normal Keeping employees. I'd love to keep clients that long too, but employees for five or 10 years. Ah, got it. So that was, so that kind of helped lead you to that decision of putting the employees at the top then basically. Correct. Got it. Cause then, and probably the customer uh, or client uh, churn is probably higher when employees churn as well, basically. So I would imagine it is. there's a correlation. Yeah, they lose. There. This is a true story. I was on a call last week. We have a client who's gone through eight point of contacts in less than a year. No agency ever wants to admit that that happens. Now, Truth be told, four of those people end up getting promoted, right? Okay. So we were giving them really good talent. They just get promoted, right? If you have a good point of contact at an agency, it's it's inevitable. They're going to get promoted, right? You know, he made a joke about how um, person A begat person B who begat person C, right? Like total Bible, Old Testament joke. And it was hilarious. And they were a happy client, by the way. Great results, had a good experience, but he was still chiding us a tiny bit on where we could improve. And it was having a stable point of contact. Now, Obviously, my averages are way significantly better than an eight point of contact per per client, but it does happen. You know, you got yeah. fringe cases, every everybody does, and it's not a good experience. So having somebody stabilized running the account, definitely a very important tactic. Cool. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about owning a business? I think a lot of people think you're immediately going to be profitable and going to be able to quit your nine to five job. <clears throat> so if you're trying to open up an Amazon brand store, for example, um, as an entrepreneur, you got this great product idea, maybe you got a patent on it, right? There's two types of products, in my opinion, by the way. There's the co-op demand type product. This is the lookalike. Maybe you made a slight adjustment or a slight improvement. You know, you're selling a new Apple slicer with an additional feature, if you will, widget. And the second type of product is demand gen. And that's where you solve a problem people don't even know exists. Right? You're selling sliced bread 10 years before anybody even knows sliced bread's the next best thing since sliced bread. And so as an entrepreneur, you don't realize that your product is not going to enter the market and take it by storm, most likely. It takes time. It takes investment and the ability to see that investment over 12 plus months. Um, I think a lot of people just have a lot of giddiness when they start their business and they don't realize the hard nature of the work, right? You're never going to work as hard for your business unless it's like, you know, the only thing that puts food on the table. Additionally, uh, your employees will never work as hard as you as the business owner and, and nor should they, right? And so I think a lot of people, they start hiring talent and they, and they have massive expectations and they're totally let down, but that's the nature of the beast. Like that is the current state of affairs. So you have to inspire um, the company to follow a vision and execute it to try and grow it. Very good. Um... Kind of shifting gears here, how do you incorporate a healthy lifestyle and fitness into your life? So I'm at my all-time high weight right now, disappointingly. And so for Father's Day this year, my wife gave me a Fitbit and we have been trying to average 10,000 steps a day. One of the core values that my Amazon guy is go the extra mile. And so one of the things that I tried to do for my company and for myself to lead by example was over the course of uh, two months. If you took 10,000 steps a day, I gave everybody a hundred dollar gift card. Um, not all hundred employees finished that process, <laughs> unfortunately. And so I'm looking at ways to try and, um, make people literally go the extra mile 
not just figuratively, but literally go the extra mile and staying healthy. And for those that did complete it, though, they had some remarkable changes, uh, weight loss, healthier, happier em- employees. And some of the phrases that that we've seen thrown around was, you know, you really invested in my life, not just in me as an employee. And it just makes a big difference on their outcome and delivery. So yeah, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at 227 uh, pounds today. And I really want to get down to 210, um, probably in the next six months, but because of the massive cold and flu outbreak of the season, the last 45 days, I've barely been able to get out of the house and make that happen. I picked up pneumonia. So like when you're working really hard, it becomes really hard to, uh, take care of yourself. Yeah. Well, I'm super encouraged to hear that you, uh, not only have been trying, although maybe struggling at times, but, uh, you know, putting that effort out there and for your whole company, a hundred people to, uh, to challenge and reward them uh, to uh, to go that extra mile. That's pretty uh, that's pretty neat. So kudos to you and uh, good luck with uh, continuing that effort as well. So where do you see yourself in ten years, both uh, professionally and personally? I want my Amazon guy to be a fifty million dollar annual company with a tech stack and an agency and a product business. So that's a very uh, large goal uh, and it's going to require a lot of work, but we're hiring based on the future of trying to hit those metrics. And so that means not only am I hiring for an agency, but a product business and a tech development stack. It's, there's a lot to build, but you know, personally, I really think that manufacturing is going to come back to the United States. I really want to have vertical control. I want to have vertical control of the product business. I want to have vertical control of the SaaS business. And I just want to be able to have a control of my entire destiny without having to rely upon any third party. So that's the future for me and my business. I love the the clarity that you've got, uh, you know, for that 10 years out. So good luck with that. Uh, obviously, things can change over time, but it's you don't get there if you don't have a goal to um, that you're reaching for, basically. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, in what ways do you find it hard to balance owning a business and having a personal life? I have four kids, six and under, and I have a personal philosophy that you should have prosperity in all things. I'll, I'll say it one more time because I think it's it's very unusual statement, prosperity in all things. And so what that requires is um, I'm not letting my wife and kids down at the state for the sake of the business or vice versa. Every component of my life is balanced with the notion that it needs to be prosperous. And, and I really truly believe it's possible. And I think a lot of people give up on certain areas when they double down or focus in, um, and they juggle the balls and purposely drop some. I never drop a ball. And there's going to be some people listening to this that are going to criticize that because, of course, at some point, some ball surely must hit the ground. It will not. No. Everything must be prosperous all the time. Well, that is... Uh... That is a really uh, big goal, and it sounds like you're you're working hard to to make that happen day to day, basically. So, congratulations with that, and um, and keep going because that's uh, your kids only have one father, and obviously your business needs you at the same time, basically. So, um, it is a challenge. When I'm shooting YouTube videos and my two year old comes down, I let her cl- crawl into my lap, and I keep shooting. Yeah, one shot take. I never edit. And so they become part of the story. <laughs> yep. It, whatever it takes with the family included. Working from home, also a net benefit, no commute, not a lot of travel. So I get to see my kids a lot. That's, um, that's neat. Well, as we kind of get close to the end here, what have I not asked that uh, you wish I would have asked? I think these are great questions. I, was, I feel like I was able to tell my story pretty well here. Um, but what I would say is... Uh, if there was one book that I'd recommend uh, that if, if somebody's trying to become an entrepreneur and they haven't read this book yet, you got to, and it's traction. And this has more systems building immediate efficacy than any other book out there. And it really helped me put my vision doc down and add the clarity and the next steps and being able to sh- section out the systems and why they matter. So that's probably the only question I'd ask is what book would I read if I was trying to improve my systems in the next 30 days? It's definitely 100% traction. And then have the rest of your company read it too. I bought it for all my employees. Cool. That's a, that's a good one. And where can viewers go uh, to learn more about you and your company? MyAmazonGuy.com. Um, and if you are an aspiring Amazon seller and you just want some tutorial videos, um, just go over to YouTube.com slash MyAmazonGuy. Um, I do answer every comment left on any video on the channel. So it's a great way to interact with me if you got a question. 
That's awesome. Well, Stephen, it's been so nice to have you here on the podcast today. Thank you for your time. I'm Brian Semling, and this is Thank you. the Fit for Success podcast.